and uh, and so that's literally how this, this came about. And so uh, the, the the ifs, what they do too is obviously is it denotes a choice. We all have choices, and uh, God has always given us a choice from the very first two people to us here today. And so uh, Moses definitely begins to talk about that after a few chapters in Deuteronomy. But we're supposed to be men and women who understand the times. And, and we're supposed to be prepared. And the purpose of any kind of training or discipline, especially in a time of crisis, is so that we can respond to what's going on, not react. It's easy to react, and most people will. But we want to respond. And, and in order to do that, we need to understand the Word of God. But we also need to understand what to be looking for. And what does it say in Matthew 24 and 25? It says to be watchful, be ready, and be prepared. And it goes on to say that in Mark 13 and in Luke 21. And it continues to repeat those admonitions. Because, because if something surprises us, something comes on us and we're not aware of it, what do we do? What's the reaction? Anybody? Panic. What? Panic. Panic. Fear. And over 350 times, God's word says, do not fear, because it's our default. It's what we do. But the people of God are supposed to do that. Okay? That's why he kept saying, I'm telling you this now, so when it happens, you're not going to go to your default. So, Winston Churchill said, fear is a reaction. Courage is a decision. Okay? And many times in a crisis, the person that stands up, the person that isn't reacting, that stands up and speaks for something, many times becomes the leader. Because he or she wasn't afraid to stand up and say something. So, Deuteronomy is Moses' farewell address to the people. He's been telling them things for 40 years. But in Deuteronomy, this is his last chance to get it through to the people. Because after this, he passes away. God takes him home. And so, this is he's got to figure out, what can I say? I've been telling them things for 40 years, but what can, what, what can I say that's going to be the most important thing I can tell them. And that's what Deuteronomy is about. And the entire generation had passed, save Caleb and Joshua and Moses. They all died in the wilderness because of their unbelief and their disobedience and their failure to trust God and his commandments. So everybody from 20 and under we're still there. But everybody at that point and above didn't go into the promised land, save two. So now they're standing on the bank of the Jordan as and they've had 40 as just as they had 40 years earlier. And they're they're about to cross over into the promised land. And that's the set, that's the setting of Deuteronomy. Now, Moses starts off the chapter recounting what happened. What happened? You know, how did you come out of this, uh, Egypt? What was going on during that time? That's what he's talking about in, in the uh, first few chapters. And, and in chapter, uh, chapters 4 uh, through 34, they're dedicated toward imploring the people to keep God's commands. 
and giving instructions for the future. Because they lost a whole generation to it right before this. So let's make sure that it doesn't happen again in the next generation. So it says in Deuteronomy 4, 1 and 2, Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and the judgments which I teach you, for to do for for to do them that ye may live and go and possess the land which Yah and your fathers gives you. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments which I command you. So in chapters uh, 4 through 34, he's admonishing them, reminding them, uh, and he's teaching them the commands, and he repeats many things over and over again, knowing that faith comes from him. And again, this is his last chance to speak into the minds and the hearts and the spirits. And he begins to repeat this one phrase over and over again. Guard his commandments. Statutes and do them. Okay? You know, we're to learn them, guard them, and do them. Now, some people learn them, and that's good. But they don't guard them. Some people learn them and guard them, but they don't do them. Okay? You have to follow through. All three things are important, and you need to be able to follow through. So as I was counting all these, these, these things, 32 times it says this over and over again. 32 times. In, cha in the chapters, uh, you know, pretty much he says it 13 times in chapters 1 through 10, and 19 chapter times in chapters 11 through 32. And you know, they tell you you should pay attention to something that God says twice. But when he says it this many times, we're trying, he's trying to get our attention because he's drilling it into us. Now, in Deuteronomy 11, Moses again begins to reiterate, reiterate the constant admonition that he did in the first 10 chapters. Therefore, you should love Yahuwah. And the Lord your God and guard his watch, guard and watch his statutes, his judgments, his commandments, always. However, there's a shift that comes in Moses' and Moses' presentation in verse 13, which then continues throughout the rest of the book. It wasn't in the first part, but from chapter 11 on, it's something that he says over and over and over. And what is that? It's if. Moses shifts from commanding the people as he did in the first ten chapters to saying, if. Yeah. He's giving the people an option. Now, do people have a tendency to choose the wrong option more or less? What do you think? More. Absolutely. It seems like the moment one of the leaders dies, the very next chance, they're like, screwing up. They're no longer following. See, they had the opportunity to have a personal relationship with God and hear everything that Moses said. But they said, no, no, you go to it. We can't handle this. And they never got another opportunity again. Until national. So we see this happen over and over again because they didn't have that, that personal relationship. Okay? We have such a wonderful, much more different opportunity to relate to God than they did. And so the people are clearly begin are being given a choice. And it's the same choice. That God presents to everyone. Jesus spent much more time giving people choices 
than he ever did telling him what to do. Right? And since he is the word of God, and when we read the whole Bible, it's it is the word of God. So it's the same choice from Adam and Eve up. If you follow God's commands, then these things are done. If you don't, so do you want a blessing or do you want a curse behold I set before you this day a blessing or a curse a blessing if ye obey the commandments yeah, which I command you this day and a curse if he will not obey, obey of God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other Elohim, which ye have not known. <coughs> and and it's like we look at today, you know, these things don't have to be stone or wood; they can be all kinds. Of in fact, there's so many things you can pick and choose from today. It's like, you know, it's hard, it's hard to choose. But but something inside of all of us causes us to have to commit to something. Now, some of us, you know, some of the people today, they commit to a cause. And that cause becomes almost their God. And everything is secondary to that cause. Because they were made to commit to something. But all too often, as we just didn't really discuss, they commit to something else. They don't commit to God. They commit to other Elohim. Now, we're going to talk about the if you don'ts. Get those out of the way. So then we can talk about the if you do's, which are much, much better than the if you don'ts. So, in Deuteronomy 11, 16 through 18, it says, here we go again, guard yourself that your heart may not, uh, that your heart be not deceived when ye turn aside and serve other Elohim and worship them. And then Yah's wrath will be kindled against you, and he shut up the heavens, that there won't be any rain, and the land and won't yield her fruit. And lest ye perish quickly from off the good land which God gives you. So, so if we don't follow God's commands, well, things aren't necessarily going to work out. Well. We might have a lot of land. We might have a lot of money. We might have a lot of stuff. But it's not going to work. Correct. Have you ever gone to the store and you bought this thing that was supposed to be such a great thing and you brought it back and it doesn't work? Bring it back. Try to get another one that works. Therefore shall ye lay up these things, these my words in your heart and in your soul, and you bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. It's like we need to keep God's instructions, God's commands, all that he says in the forefront. And it's so easy in these days to be so distracted. There are so many distractions. And, and, and they want to pull you away. And they're not all bad. But what are you supposed to be doing right now? What are you supposed to be doing? You know, you've set a time, some time aside to be with the Lord. You shouldn't let anything get in the way. A lot of times I pray in the morning, morning I say, Lord, give me supernatural concentration, concentration and focus on who and what I'm doing at the moment. So my mind is at one place while I'm doing something else. I want my 
all my mind, all my heart, all my spirit to be on what I'm doing in my life. One of the things that, that, that the Lord loved about David is whatever David did, he did it with his whole heart, his whole mind, his soul, his whole spirit. Even when he was doing the wrong thing, he did it that way. But but that's one of the things that he really appreciated by David, because David, most of the time, didn't get distracted. Now, but it shall come to pass that if you will not hearken unto the voice of who to guard, to do all his commandments and statutes, which I command you this day, that all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the field, and cursed shall Shall you be, uh, shall be your basket and your store. Now, I read this for probably 30 years. And for whatever reason, it just didn't click. Okay? But once I became aware and I began, God began to cultivate in me that understanding in cultivating it in you. All of a sudden, these things take on a whole new meaning. They they become so much more pertinent than they did before, because you understand what he's saying, and it's like it's like it begins to move you in ways that it didn't ever before. Now, let me just ask a question for the people here in this room. How many people have become, started to walk in their, in in a Hebraic understanding and insight? And, you know, how many people here are only the last five years? Okay. How many people here have been doing it longer than five years? You're about half and half. Okay. That is revealing this to a lot of people now. And you wonder, why didn't I know this before? Now, some people were able to know before, but it seems like all of a sudden, all kinds of people are starting to know this. And so, so, but but you know, especially because it's, especially if you're really new, that it's new to you. So then I'll go to a place, you know, to a let's say a conventional church, and I'll, I'll start to talk to them, but I'll, I'll talk about something that they can, you know, take in. But I'll, I'll just I'll just throw out a few things that if you don't know, you know it, you won't know it. And people come up afterwards and they say, did you know this? And I say, yes, I did. And, and all of a sudden, these people are out there, and they're, they're awakening, right? And this awakening is coming on more and more people. And 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 it's a varied in the way that it happened. Now, when I really got this, I was mowing the lawn. <laughs> Not especially a super spiritual experience, but I was mowing the lawn while I was listening to Jim Staley, okay, you know, in the earphones. And he was talking about the holidays. And, and I'm like, I'm tracking, okay? I kept having to pull under the tree, so, you know, because it's very bright, so that I could see what he was, what it is he was showing me. And two hours later, because I got the big one, two, two hours later, I'm like, wow. And I'm like, I'm there. Okay, I was already, I, I was like, I was already feeling some feelings and doing all this stuff, but I had no grit, you know, I had no track, I had, it's like, I was still on Windows 7, and you know, it's really Windows 10, you know, one thing I wanted to be on. And, and you know how it is, it's like, don't you hate it when they do that? You know, why couldn't they just leave it at Windows 7? I understood Windows 7. Why do we have to go to Windows 10? But, but this is what God does, see? God rewrites our operating system, okay? It's like a rewrite. 
And all these things that used to work one way, well, you know, it doesn't work that way anymore. i got to press this or go here. It's just different. New access folders. And so, so this is what God did. See, you know, when we were in the womb, God was just shocking, you know, just programming all this stuff into this thing, just putting it all in there. And then it just seems to activate. It shows us something new. This is what's going on today. When God reveals a truth to us, it's like new program time. For those of us who have watched Star Trek, remember Data? All of a sudden, some new program would kick into gear and it would just rewrite all the systems. Well, that's really what God does to us. So, so you know, God began the rewrite. And all of a sudden, I started reading the Word. And I was seeing all kinds of stuff that I never saw before. Now, was that stuff always there? Yeah. Dad didn't have the eyes to see it. I didn't have the mind to comprehend it. And so I didn't have the use. But the Lord now is showing us how to begin to pick up on things that we never picked up on. Because that's what he's doing in the earth. And God's speaking this stuff into the earth, and all these people are reacting to it, and, and, and they're beginning to take it in. And now it's, it's rewriting the old program. So, so this is a good thing. But if we don't do it, cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the fruit of your land and the increase of your kind and the flocks and your sheep. And cursed shall be when you come in and cursed shall be when you go out. You know, we live in an age where they, they, they have abortion in children like this. But on the other end of, of, of the situation, how many of you people know about people who want a child but they can't have a child? That's part of it. A curse. No fruit. Okay. And it may be nothing that that person did. Okay. But but there's the, there, the this is something that comes upon a people, okay? When you're not hearing. And, and, so, and so all these people, and, and there could be all kinds of other reasons, but it's a result. And in the earth today, there's only so much sin the earth can stand. Because is the earth a living organism? Well, yeah. We even the rocks cry out for the Lord. They're going to. I don't know how, but I know that's the case. And see, it begins to writhe and shift, change because of the, the weight of the sin upon it. Until it gets to a certain point when it's too far, it's too much. And so, so it happened in Noah's day, it's going to happen in our day. As in the days of Noah. That's the discussion in itself. But Yahuwah shall send upon you a cursing, a vexation, a rebuke in all that you set your hand to uh, for to do until you be destroyed and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings whereby you have forsaken. And so, the fear of God isn't being afraid. Fear of God is the fear of God following the way you should. The desire of pleasing the way you really want. The, the desire to not make a mistake. And how can we better not make a mistake than follow the instructions? You know, I'm not mechanical, okay? I, you know, I can tell you how to do all kinds of conceptual things, financial things, and, and you know, and form this, and I was, you know, an elected office for 14 years. I can do all that kind of stuff. When it comes to trying to, like, fix a car, my wife and I, we, you know, we got married. One day we were driving along, the car stops, like, I don't have a car, you know, I put the foot up, and, 
and we're standing out there looking at the car. She goes, well, what's wrong? I said, I have no idea. But when you get out of the car, you get out of the car, you know, when your car stops, you get out, you put the hood up, and you look at it. And, and <laughs> unless something's squirting or sparking, I have no clue what to do. So, so you know, it's, 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 an, it's, we can't do everything, okay? And so, and so, so as we go along, we're all equipped to do different things. But, you know, sometimes God can just make things work for you, too. One of my first jobs, I was working at a fitness center, and I was, and, and it had a pool, and they had these bromine tanks, and the, whatever, Whatever reason the bromine tanks always had issues. And so you'd go down, you'd do all this stuff, and you were hoping that it would start doing what it did, which would be to cleanse the water and go through the water and all that kind of thing. And so I had tried every single thing. So finally I laid hands on the machine and I said, In the name of Jesus, I command you to work. And I hit the switch and it went. Now, I didn't know that the manager was standing right over there. And, and he said, you know, Holton, I don't care how you do it. I'm just <laughs> glad you did. You know? Okay. So, so everything is in subjection to the name of Jesus, including broken pumps. So, so we got to remember that, okay? Because you know, sometimes we keep going through the motions of what we know, and we think, I know. Let me try that and try what you know Jesus can do. So now let's do a few more of he does. If you will not guard to do all the words of the Torah that are written in the supper, that you may fear the glorious and fearful name of Yahuwah, then Yahuwah will make your plagues wonderful and the plagues of your seed, even great plagues and long continuance and sore sickness and uh, and of law to continue. That does not sound good. We have more afflictions in America, more of these constant things that 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 like that the rest of the world doesn't have. These little chronic things that come upon us. Now there's other reasons for these things, <laughs> but but they just don't seem to go away. And so we need to be aware of the Word of God. Now, some of the awareness of the Word of God is say, you know, maybe you should eat this and not eat that. And maybe you should take a look at how this food is prepared, and maybe you shouldn't eat this food because of the way it was prepared. You know, when they take everything out of something and they put something else in it, it's no longer whatever it is. Right? When I teach a class, we have a disaster relief group called Isaiah 5812, and I teach this course called CERT. CERT is Community Emergency Response Teams. And we teach people to work with first responders. The first chapter talks about how you prepare for a disaster. And you know, what should you do as, as a disaster relief worker? And one of the things that they talk about is food. What should you eat? And it suggests doing something natural. Now a Twinkie is not neutral. In fact, if you read what's on a Twinkie, there's absolutely nothing in it that you can spell or pronounce. Okay? And, you know, it's like, what is that stuff? And, and if you can't pronounce it, and you can't read it, you probably shouldn't eat it. Because God gave you everything you need within a real piece of fruit or a vegetable to quite frankly digest it and eat it and all those things. So so it's like it's like we should listen to that. See, before I ever knew what the Bible said about food, I was kind of aware of what you know what are good things to eat and what aren't so good. I had already arrived at everything that it said, not because it said it in here, but because I just nutritionally analytically looked at it and said, I'm not going to eat this anymore. And I'm going to eat this. And so I changed my diet. I was pleasantly surprised that it was already in there. Wouldn't it have been nice to 
to a, they made that a little earlier. <laughs> but nevertheless, I still arrived there at the same conclusion. So when I when I read all that stuff, I thought, oh, I go that. I'm already doing it. Okay. So so even the world's ways can show you that you shouldn't ought to be doing differently. And so and so as we go into the end times, this is really, I mean, it's really interesting. There's some extremely far left liberal people who need like you to. Not because the Bible says it, but because of the same reason I just explained. There's a whole lot of people out there that are going to align with you on certain things. Don't let all the other stuff that they do get in the way. We love people to do all the right things for the right reasons. But if we can get them to do the right thing for the wrong reason, okay. You know, that's better, okay? It's, but it's in politics, you know, it's always nice to do the right thing for the right reason. But, you know, I, I sometimes I had to, you know, give people other reasons that would appeal to them to do something so they would do it. Okay? So, you know, I, when I was in the legislature for a time, you know, for two of the years, the last two years we were there, you know, the, the, the opposing party, you know, took over. And so when the opposing party takes over, your bills just don't pass. Okay. So you had to you had to do something different. So I would go to the chairman and I'd say, Mr. Chairman, I was wondering if you could help me out. I have this problem. I'm trying to figure it out. Um, in the, uh, you're the chairman. You know so much more about it than I do. So I was wondering if you could just explain this to me. And I, and I would say, does this work this way? Is that what you're doing? I'd say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd say, so what you're telling me is you could do this? I'd say, yes. I'd say, what a great idea you have. That's a, you know, that's such a good idea you have that I'll support it. It could be bipartisan. And then, him or her being the chairman of the committee, it'd get passed. Because it wasn't my bill, but it was his bill or her bill. And, and so it worked. And I call that the Colombo approach. But nevertheless, <laughs> you know, Paul did the same thing. He went to Rome, right? And he's looking at all these gods around him. Instead of freaking out over the fact that there's all these bad gods all around him, he says, oh, here's one. Got no name. I'll name it. And, and away he went. And so sometimes the Lord is going to have you step out of what you normally do and utilize what's in front of you. Well, and it shall come to pass that Yah rejoiced over you. To do, for, to do you good and to multiply you so that Yah will rejoice over you and uh, you to destroy you and to bring you to naught and ye shall be plucked off the land whether you go to possess it. And, and Yahuwah shall scatter you among all the people from one end of the earth even unto the other. That there shall be that, that that and there you shall serve other Elohim which neither you nor your fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shall you find no ease, neither shall the sole of your foot have rest, but Yahuwah shall give you there a trembling heart, a failing of your eyes. A sorrow for your mind, and your and and your life shall hang in doubt before you, and you shall fear day and night, and you shall have none assurance of your life. There's a lot of people like that out there. The, our faith, God is going to shake everything that can be shaken. If your faith is in the government, it's going to shake the government. If your faith is in your job, it's going to shake your job. If your faith is in the economy, it's going to shake the economy. If your faith is in whatever it is, he's going to shake it. But what does it say? It's going to shake everything. Why? Why is he doing that? What do you think? Capture our attention. All right. Your attention's over here. 
well, let's just shake that all apart. And then maybe your attention will come And so, so the Lord is beckoning us. And, and if our eyes are somewhere else, well, he's going to do something to get our attention. Now, here's the good part. So, if you do, and it shall come to pass that if ye shall hearken diligently to my commandments, to which I command you this day, to love Yahuwah, the Lord your God, and to serve him with all your heart and all your soul, that I will give you the rain for your land in due season. The do season. That's an important thing to farmers. They don't want rain at the wrong time. They want it at the right time. The first rain and the latter rain, that you may gather your grain and your wine and your oil, and I will send you grass in your fields for your cattle, for that you may eat and be full. So, that's a complete opposite of what he said in the earlier verses. Okay? And interestingly enough, he's also telling you that cattle should eat grass. Okay? And 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 so not all this other stuff they feed them. So again, you know, it's like it's like, you know, you're reading all these scientific nutritional magazines and everything like that, and then and then God just makes it clear right there. And but sometimes you have to see it here to see it here. So for if ye shall diligently guard, or guard, all the commandments which I command you to do, and you do them to love the Hua, and to walk in all his ways, and to cleave unto him, then the Hua will drive out all these nations from before you, and ye shall possess greater nations, mightier than yourselves. Every place whereupon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours, from the wilderness in Lebanon to the river in Pera, even unto the uttermost sea shall be your shall your coast be. There shall be no man be able to stand before you, for Yahuwah shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon the land that they shall tread upon as he has said unto you. Why is it that you can believe almost anything to Christianity? Why? Why is it? What is it that causes people to get all stirred up when you express your faith or you do something that's a faithful thing to do? Why does that bother them? What is it? See, see, it's like how many times in your life has somebody just You've not said a word. You haven't done anything. They just don't like you. <laughs> and they treat you in a certain manner. It's just like, well, you know, what have I done to this person? I've said nothing. I've done nothing. But they just don't like me. What's going on is their spirit in them has recognized the spirit in you. And those two spirits oppose one another. Those people are operating, their, their flesh is listening to their spirit. Unfortunately, it's not the spirit of God, or it's not the spirit of our God, and it's reacting to you. Then on the other hand, there are some people where you've said nothing. You've done nothing, but they just are so nice to you. You're just doing all these nice things, saying all these nice things, and you're thinking, Wow. But then why are they doing that? Well, your spirit is the same as your spirit, and there's a recognition that's going on there. When I was a financial advisor for 
over 20 years, sometimes somebody would come into the office and they would start telling me that I always want to stop them and say, you know what? I've known you for 10 minutes. And you're telling me very intimate and important things. And and but see, I finally started realizing this wasn't a financial planning appointment. This was an appointment for this person to come in and tell me whatever it is they're telling me. So I would shift hats and I would say, okay. Now, as they're telling me this stuff, do you want me to do something about this or do you want me to just listen? Do you want me to do with this while they're talking? And sometimes he'd say, do this, do that, and and, what? and and sometimes that person would never come back. They just came for that moment. Okay? And we, we have to learn to do that. It's like my wife. She starts telling me something. If I'm not sure, I'll say, honey, do you want me to fix this? Do you want me to just listen? I just want you. Okay. So, you know, if I'm not sure, I should just, you know, I ask the question because it's easier. That way I don't have to figure it out. But 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 sometimes that's what we're supposed to do. When God shows us something, we're not supposed to tell everybody what we see. Sometimes we're just supposed to take it in. Okay? And there's nothing wrong with asking him in the midst of it. Want me to do something about this or want me to just, you just show us? Because the Lord wants to sometimes allow you to see something so that later but but see the cool thing is 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 when we begin to get that kind of relation with him, relationship with him he can do too and it shall come to pass that if you shall hearken diligently not half-heartedly not most of the time diligently Unto the voice of Yahuwah to guard and do his commandments, which I command you this day, then Yahuwah will set you on high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come to you and overtake you. Wouldn't it be nice to just be overtaken by blessing? Overtake you. If you shall hearken unto the voice of Yahuwah, blessed be, blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field, and blessed shall you be the fruit of your body, and the fruit uh, of your ground, and the fruit of your cattle, and the increase of your kind, and the flocks of your sheep. Blessed shall be your basket and your store, and blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. Moses started talking about this in his last opportunity to speak to the people. In one of Jesus' first opportunities to speak, what did he say? Well, blessed be those that do this, those that do that. And then what did he do? Then he focused on the same thing that that Moses focused on, which was the Ten Commandments. So, they both talked about the same thing, Moses in his closing remarks, and Jesus in his opening remarks. I find it very interesting that they said the same thing. But, he is the Word of God, and that was the Word of God, so, of course. But, but it's just interesting. You know, I never thought drew the connection to what he said, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, and what he said in Deuteronomy. But they're both talking about the Ten Commandments. But when you really actually get into, especially in Matthew, Jesus started talking about the Ten Commandments, and then he started, after every one of them, he said, but, every one, you can go look, but, I say you, and all of a sudden, he's given us a little more insight into what that means. Moses was given a little more insight into what those Ten Commandments meant in Deuteronomy, and Jesus was given a little more insight into what those Ten Commandments meant in Matthew. And so, you know, I never, I mean, understanding what we're all trying to understand, it's such a document. 
I mean, I didn't realize there were so many dots, and I really didn't realize they were all connected. But that's what reading the whole thing says to us. We begin to connect those dots. So, Yah shall cause your enemies that rise up against you to be smitten before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee seven ways. Yah shall command the blessing upon you in your storehouses that all that you set your hand to shall bless you in the land which Yahuwah gives you. Yahuwah shall establish you a holy people unto himself as he sworn unto you. See, that's kind of the intro to the next thing I'm going to talk about tomorrow, which is the remnant, okay? Set apart. See, even the earth, even, even the people in the world are hearing this remnant message. How do we know that? Well, let's see. We've got the Avengers, we've got Star Wars, we've got the Virgin, we've got, you know, Hunger Games. With somehow, everybody is just... They, they, there's something about a small band of survivors who are set apart, who against all odds are able to defeat the evil empire. It's being spoken into the earth, so even the world is hearing it. It's just coming out in a different way. Okay? But if you shall guard the commandments of Yahuwah and you walk in his ways and and all the people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of Yahuwah. Then shall, the, and they shall be afraid of you. Do you think the, the, the Pharisees were afraid of Joshua? Absolutely. They couldn't verbally deal with him. And he could do all kinds of stuff that they couldn't do. He was a threat. Do you ever look at yourself as a threat? You're extremely threatening to somebody who, up until you, have encountered everybody else like them, and all of a sudden now they've encountered you, and oh my gosh, they can't figure you out, and all the stuff that you're seeing sounds pretty right, and if all that's true, they're going to have to change. My mom and I had this conversation once, and my mom was in the And it's like, she said, if I believed in Jesus like you believe in Jesus, I'd have to change my mind. And I said, Mom, if you believe in Jesus like I believe in Jesus, you'd want to change your life. That was the beginning and the end of the conversation. She got it, but she isn't willing to change. And and there's a whole lot of people out there that are not willing to change. And when they tell you that, move on. Okay? Shake the dust off the sandals and move on to somebody who may want to change. Or there's a doorway open. Because, because there's a whole lot of people out there that do. You don't know it. They do. So, if if you guard all the if you guard the commandments of Yahuwah and you walk in His ways, and all the people of the earth shall see it, that you are called by Yahuwah's name, they shall be afraid of you, and Yahuwah shall make you plenteous goods, and the fruit of your body, and the fruit of your cattle, and and the fruit of your, the ground and the land which Yahuwah swore to your fathers to give you, Yahuwah shall open unto you his goods, his treasures, uh, the heavens, and give you rain upon your land and in, in his season, and bless all the work of your hand, and you shall lend to uh, unto many nations, and you shall not be a borrower. If you hearken to the voice of Yahuwah to guard his commandments and his statutes, which are written in the Sefer and the Torah, and if you turn unto El Yahuwah with all your heart and with all your soul, for this, command, for, for this commandment 
which I command you this day. It is not hidden from you, neither it is, is it far off. It, it is not in heaven that you should say, who shall go up for us to heaven and bring, bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who shall go to the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very high unto you and in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it and see, I have set before you this day good. Uh, I have set before you this day life and good and death and evil. Boy, are we in a time where people are messing that up? I don't. I can't remember a time where more people were calling evil good and good evil. But today, that's exactly what's happening. And these people. They believe what they say. See, that's why you can just, it's like somebody that believes something, like really believes it, you tell them the facts. It should prove that whatever this thing is, even if it's not a spiritual thing, that it's not true, but they believe it. And so it doesn't matter how many facts you give them. It doesn't much matter how much proof you give them. This is what they believe. So you can't change it. They didn't listen to Jesus. They're not going to listen to you. Okay? So, so that's that's the way it is. And Yahuwah shall make you the head and not the tail. And you shall be above only. And you shall not be beneath. If you hearken unto the commandment that's Yahuwah, which I command you this day, and you guard them, and do them. And you shall not go aside from any of the words which I command you this day, to the right hand or to the left, to go after other Elohim and to serve them. In a crisis, when a crisis occurs and people don't know what to do, they're going to follow anybody. When we did disaster relief work, we would go down to an area and, and, and maybe they were having an organized thing going on there, and maybe it wasn't so organized. But it was like, it was like sometimes what would happen is you'd say, you'd make a suggestion, why don't you put that over there? And why don't you put this over here? And then he's watching, so then he comes up and he says, well, what should I do with this? And the next thing you know, you're in charge, okay? And, and, and that's the way it, it is, okay? I took a bunch of guys in Hurricane Katrina, and we took off, and we went off, and we were cutting all these trees off of houses. But my daughter was left in the warehouse. She looked about 17, but she was 21. And, and, and she was told to go in and try to help organize the warehouse. But what ended up happening was, when I came back about six hours later, she was up on a box with a bullhorn directing the whole place. <laughs> because when she went in, she looked at where everything was. It was a blown out wind dicks and the food and water and clothes and everything. She, all, all this way. she figured out where it should go based on what she was looking at. And then she just started doing what I told you first. Why don't you do this? And, you know, and, and there's these two New York Union dot guys standing next to me, and the one guy says, What should I do with this? He says, Well, go ask Miss Jenny. She sure seems to know what she's doing. Now, there's no fleshly reason that she's only 5'2, by the way, too. There's no fleshly reason that the entire group of people there would follow her. But she had a plan. She had a better plan than anybody else did, so they followed her. That's how it is. That's how it will be, okay? So when you're not reacting like everybody else, people are going to all of a sudden focus on you and they're going to say, I'm following you. Because you seem to know what you're doing. And we're to be people who what? Understand the times and know what to do. So we've got some great guidelines here. Only if, okay, 
So, but it shall come to pass that if thou wilt not hearken to the voice of the Lord of thy God to observe all the command, all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you this day, all the curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. But if you do, only if you carefully hearken to the voice of Yahuwah to guard and to do all these commandments, which I command you today. Only. So, Deuteronomy, more than any other book in the Bible, says over and over again, guard your heart, mind, soul, and spirit. Because it's under attack. Okay. How many ways is it under attack? Oh my gosh. Think about it. It's under attack so many ways. News, media, the social media. We don't go to court anymore. We're judged on Facebook. Okay? Or Twitter. They decide whether somebody's guilty. Doesn't matter what the courts do. Public opinion is supposed to judge us. Personally, I'd rather not get judged on Facebook or Twitter. I'd much rather, you know, get judged for what is real. But if we do guard our hearts, our minds, our spirits, and God's commandments and statutes, which are most important, it clearly lays out the blessing and the curses connected with following or not following God and His commandments and His instructions. Matthew 24, 25, Luke 21, Mark 13 tells us what? It tells us to be watchful. It tells us to be prepared. So like the five wise virgins, it doesn't matter when the bridegroom comes because your lamp is full. He can come anytime he wants in your bed. Okay? That's why they were wise and the other ones weren't. Were they, does, does it ever say that the other five virgins were evil? No. They were believers. They loved one another. It's just five were prepared. They were the original preppers. Okay? So, we need to remember that. Some people are storing additional cash, and food, and water, and ammunition, and other supplies. However, I can't think of a better way. Oh, I am doing something. However, I cannot think of a better way to protect and provide and prepare yourself than searching out and understanding scripture on how to walk according to God's commandments, so as to make ourselves spiritually as bulletproof as possible, as all these end-time events are literally rolling out in front of us. Literally rolling out in front of us. So, when we begin to see some of these things that are going on in the days of Noah, we're not going to be saying, oh my gosh, Look at that. We're going to see. Oh, I wonder how that's going. I wonder how. how and, and we're going to keep our heads and we're going to respond, not react. We're not going to be fearful. We're going to be clear. Because we've already thought it through. You know, in the shirt, in, in, the, in those new Sherlock Holmes movies, where, you know, the, the he. You see the whole thing take place before the action happens. He, the Sherlock is thinking it out in his brain. Every move in the fight, everything that happens next. So when it happens, he's already prepared for the move. That's why Jesus said, I've already told you these things so that when they happen, you understand what you're saying. So, that's all. <laughs> all right, I think there, next is dinner. Is that right?